In today's interview, we are honored to welcome Professor Sally Mapstone, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of St. Andrews. What does it comprise to lead a university? How does one come to be the principal? She will come due to your studies and she might, as she says, tap you on the head when you graduate. But did you know she's a keen runner? This and much more in today's episode of Insight. Enjoy listening. You're listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Veronika Sedlákova. Join us as we journey through the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. So today's interview is with Professor Sally Mapstone, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of St. Andrews. We're very honoured to have you here. I'm delighted to have been asked to take part. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you very much. In case that someone needs a reminder, I suppose, could you please tell us what, what your positions here in St. Andrews are? I'm the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of St. Andrews. This is a particularly Scottish collocation in that the principals of uh, Scottish universities are also known as vice chancellors. I see. And what path led you to this position? I came to St Andrews from the University of Oxford, where I had spent the majority of my career after a brief period working in the publishing industry in, in London really early on. After that, I became an academic and I was based in Oxford, as I said. And for the latter part of my career, I I suppose I conducted a sort of dual path where I was both an academic and someone working in the very senior levels of the university leadership. So before I came to St. Andrews at Oxford, I was first of all the pro-vice-chancellor for personnel and equality, and then pro-vice-chancellor for education, which meant I was in charge of education policy right across the university. Another reason for coming to St. Andrews was that my research specialism is older Scots literature, which is really medieval and Renaissance Scottish literature. So I had been working as an academic researcher in Scotland for the best part of 30 years and knew St. Andrews really well. So you have visited St. Andrews before? Many times, yes. Okay. And can you tell us more about your research? My research focuses on literature produced in Scotland from really the late 15th to the early 17th century, though I've written on Scottish literature, including modern Scottish literature as well. I write about literature written in Scots, which some people think is a language and some people think is a dialect, and I'm not going to give a verdict on that particular debate. And I also write about literature in Latin, which was a major language for Scottish culture in the late medieval and early modern period. So those are the two languages that I concentrate on, though I have occasionally written bits and pieces about Scots Gaelic uh, literature as well. I have a particular interest in political literature and in literature focusing on issues of government and governance. And I have also done a great deal of work on what is known as book history, so manuscript production and the transmission from manuscript into print. I see that's such a rich and interesting wide range of topics. Um, So just to make sure, can you read all these uh, languages or if Scots is a dialect, then a dialect? Yeah, I have to. If you're a medievalist, you need a lot of languages because you, you know, you need to be able to read French and German and Italian helps. You have to have Latin. It's not really possible, in my opinion, to be a serious medievalist if you don't have Latin, because if you can't read it, that just cuts off a huge amount of source literature to you, because that was the the lingua franca in the Middle Ages. So so that's your basic arsenal of languages if you're going to be a really serious medievalist, in, in my view. And, you know, every subject, I suppose, that one studies requires a certain amount of uh, additional supplementation. And in, in my case, it's very much on the on the language side. I'm always trying to extend the range of my linguistic capacity. That is incredible. As someone who barely speaks the languages, then uh, this is very in- impressive. And can I ask what inspired you to focus on Scottish literature in the first place? 
It is a good question because I got interested in Scottish literature when I was an undergraduate at Oxford, where the English literature and language course was capacious, but it was very English. And when we were studying the literature of the 15th century, I found myself being directed to read a lot of prose and poetic romances, which, uh, with the exception of the writings of Sir Thomas Mallory, who I thought and still think were terrific, I didn't really like very much. So I started reading around, and I discovered the 15th century Scottish writers, particularly Robert Henderson and William Dunbar, and I was just transfixed and absolutely transported. And I, uh, so I requested that I should be allowed to study medieval Scots. And I was told that at the time there was nobody in Oxford to teach it. I mean, that's how, you know, um, benighted things were back in the, in the 1970s. Um, so I initially studied it um, off my own back, and then I was eventually sent for some tutorials to a tutor in Cambridge. And I think that my, my Oxford tutors took the view that if I had to travel to Cambridge in a single day, there and back, which was a big bus journey, that would put me off wanting to study medieval Scottish literature. But I'm quite counter-suggestible, so, so it didn't. And really, that was how it began. I see. That is a rosy day story. So eventually you became someone who would teach it on Oxford, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I see. Do you have a favorite Scottish author or a piece of Scottish literature? I have many, but I would have to stay in the Middle Ages, I think. In my view, one of the greatest pieces of literature written in the Middle Ages is a poem by the the Fife writer, who's actually based in Dunfermline, Robert Henderson, called The Testament of Cressid. And this is a poem which inserts itself very brilliantly into the action of book five of Chaucer's poem, Troilus and Crusade. And instead of focusing on Troilus, it focuses on Cressid and what happened to Cressid after she and Troilus um, parted company. And quite unusually for a piece of medieval literature, the poem increasingly focuses on what Cressid herself has to say, and her voice becomes the dominant voice in the poem. It's a stark, bleak, really very challenging poem, but it's unusual in the prominence it gives to its voice, and that's one of the many reasons why I've always found it one of the most remarkable pieces of Scottish literature. That does sound very interesting. Not terribly long, but it's a brilliant poem. <laughs> <laughs> and now, maybe going back to your path to St Andrews, what was it that convinced you to leave Oxford, where you spent a significant part of your career, and come up to St Andrews? It's a great question, because I was very settled and happy at Oxford. And as a medievalist, Oxford is a great place to be based, because it has an incredible concentration of people who work on medieval culture. But as I said earlier, I'd visited St Andrews many times. I knew it quite well as a university. I admired it as a university. So when the opportunity to take a significant leadership position came up, I felt that this was one of the few places that I I could enthusiastically contemplate leaving Oxford for. I had a lot in common with St Andrews, and I thought I could contribute something. So it was really the attraction of, um, towards the end of my career, challenging myself to do something different for an institution, which I felt very drawn to and which I admired hugely. Well, that is a uh, that is an amazing motivation. I think we're all happy uh, that you made the move. So I did a little research, <laughs> and uh, it seems that you have moved twice: once from London to Oxford, and then from Oxford to St Andrews. Yeah. What was it like moving between these places? They seem so significantly different. Yes, very interesting. Well, I think for me, coming back, I'd been at Oxford as an undergraduate, and then I went down to. London and worked in publishing and that's probably one of the reasons why I've ended up in the kind of job I do now because I liked working in business um you know I'm not afraid of balance sheets and I like the notion that you you turn the way you think into a product like a a book but then I really wanted to write my own books which was why I went back to Oxford and became an academic and I think well coming from London where I'd, I'd grown up anyway was was not such a big deal but coming Back from, if you like, the world of work into the world of study was 
a little bit of a shock to the system because I had been professionalized by working in publishing, even though publishing is, is a, you know, a sort of, it still remains a, a business that has a sort of gloriously kind of amateurish quality in it because you, it's very hard to tell what's going to succeed as a book and what, what won't. And that's one of the nice things about it. But I had professionalized myself. And when I came back to Oxford, I, I was a different kind of person from how I'd left it when I was, um, uh, you know, just a, a, a normal undergraduate with the, the normal interests that undergraduates have. So it's strange coming back, but I think in many ways that meant that because I changed my career in order to come back, I was very focused uh, when I became a graduate student. And then when I went on to, I knew if I was going to make a change in career, I had to make it successfully. I think coming from Oxford to St. Andrews, the the biggest change was simply that, you know, my husband and I had a a life and a house and friends in Oxford, and though we had persistently visited Scotland, to come and face ourselves here was doing something really rather different, but we haven't regretted it for a second. Indeed, we both think it was the best move we've ever we've ever made. We uh, absolutely love it here. That is great to hear. And one thing that I found was that in both Oxford and St. Andrews, you started a mentoring initiative for senior female academics. What was the rationale behind behind this initiative? I've always benefited from mentoring uh, throughout my career. When I was an undergraduate at Oxford, I was there at a time where there were, you know, there are 30 plus colleges in Oxford. And at that time, there were five that were only for women. And there were five, including my own, that were mixed men and women. And all the rest were for, for men. So women were in a distinct minority and this was really when feminism was kind of taking off in the mid-1970s. And I was very involved in starting consciousness raising groups run by women for women in Oxford. And those were hugely influential on me. I found them both very supportive and very intellectually and kind of spiritually stimulating. So I've, I've always believed in the value of peer mentoring, but I've also believed in, in the value of mentoring from one person to another. And really throughout my career, I have taking the view that women are absolutely equally well equipped to undertake roles that are often taken by men, but we don't inhabit even now a society that is equal. And so anything you can do to help women, to encourage women, to support women, and to make women feel that they can achieve even beyond what they're achieving already, I think should be done. And I think is a significant intervention that was absolutely necessary to make. So when I was in charge of equality at Oxford, I started the Ad Feminam mentoring scheme, typically being Oxford, it used a Latinate title. At St. Andrews, we have done something similar, which I've sponsored, um, but we call this the Elizabeth Garrett mentoring scheme, and this honours the name of a woman who was not well treated initially. Uh, by this university. She attempted to matriculate to study medicine in 1862. She was permitted to matriculate until it was realized that she was a woman. And at that point, the university essentially dematriculated her. She wasn't deterred, and she went on to become a, a, one of the most significant early women medics in Britain. And I wanted to remember her name in our university and reframe it within the context of doing something really positive for senior women in the university in order to enable them to be the best that they can be. Well, thank you for sharing this story. I haven't realized the story of Elizabeth yeah. Gary. That does make a lot of sense. And also, I think that as the principal for, of our university, you provide a great role model for women. That's, yeah. that's kind of you to say, but I, I, I take the view that role models are really important. They are or aren't? They are. They absolutely oh, okay. are. I think role models are incredibly important and go on being important. They have been for me throughout my career. And alas, we still live in a world where role models are, are meaningful. And I'm not talking about myself here, but we have across the university a lot, I'm pleased to say, of really impressive role models. Mm -hmm. That is true. And since we've touched on your role as the principal of the university. Can we speak about that for a, for a little? I was wondering, what is your favorite part of the job? Yeah, that's such an interesting, that's such an interesting question. 
I, for me, I think one of the, the favourite parts of the job is actually graduation ceremonies. Uh, I love that moment, and you know, we've missed it so much in the past 18 months, where you see students coming across the stage, and we are celebrating those students as individuals, and we are celebrating everything that they've achieved during four years, or sometimes one year, or sometimes five years at the university, depending on what degree uh, they've been studying. We recognize them, we applaud them, we celebrate them, and, you know, I have the honor of tapping them on the head on many occasions. And in that moment, I see those individuals very closely. I see how much it means to them. I hear the applause of their family and friends and the whole audience recognizing that remarkable achievement that nobody can take away from them. And that summation of a university career in that moment, I think, is something incredibly special. And it's a real privilege to be able to participate in it. So if I had to, to pick one aspect, only one, I think it would not be that, because those moments sum up an individual's career to that stage, but also give you a sense of what they're then going to go on and do next. You can see that in their faces as well. It's that sense of completing one stage of a career and getting that sense of, you know, now I can go off and do other things. And that is just fantastic. I see. So celebrating the successful degree and the great prospects into the future exactly. and the ceremony. Yeah, Thanks. exactly. We do the ceremony really well. I've been to many graduation ceremonies at many universities across the world, and I can honestly say that we do them at St Andrews better than anywhere else I've, I've been. Well, that is amazing to hear. <laughs> it's seriously, it's a, I've said that from the heart. Okay. <laughs> what is the distinguishing aspect then? That we, we do them to such a high degree of quality. So the quality of what we do and the sort of the, the ritual that we do is really good. But also we recognize each individual separately and other universities don't necessarily do that. Some universities, I won't say which, but some universities group students together and sort of herd them across the stage. And you don't get that kind of individual achievement, which we bring out, I think, better than, than anybody else. I see. One thing that keeps going in my, in my mind is that we were speaking about the role models. And I sort of feel I ought to ask if you have an important role model, someone that inspired you. So I have two people who inspired me, actually. Um, I mean, I have many, in fact, but neither of them is, is with us anymore, but they were very important to me earlier in my career. One was a woman called Mary Moore, who was one of the principals of St. Hilda's College, Oxford, where I spent much of my career. And Mary was quite remarkable because she was having a very successful career in the Foreign Commonwealth Office until... She met and married her husband, who was also in the Foreign Office, at which point in those days, if you were a woman, you had to stand down. You could not continue to work in the Foreign Office if you were married to somebody else who worked for them. And it was invariably the woman who lost her job. And Mary did a remarkable thing and reinvented herself as a, as a novelist. She wrote a couple of very successful novels. And then she reinvented herself as a university leader and became head of an Oxbridge College. And she was a great friend to me. Um, she was also the most fantastic role model. She was incredibly elegant, very funny, but hugely supportive. Um, and then the other role model for me was um, the late Elizabeth Falaise, who was a little bit ahead of me in the sort of hierarchy at Oxford and acted as a mentor to me. Um, she was pro vice chancellor for education, a role that I eventually took on uh, just after she died. And she was hugely impressive to me as a role model because she showed me what could be done within the still very male dominated environment in Oxford without, you know, losing any sense of herself. She remained completely true to herself. But um, she absolutely knew how to fight her corner, which in university leadership you need to be able to do. So she was an inspir both an inspiration to me and somebody who directly mentored me. And I always like to take the opportunity to acknowledge um, what she gave to me. I see. Okay. So these are two very inspiring women for you. Um, thanks for coming back to this. Uh, jumping back ahead again, so we spoke about your favorite part uh, of your job, which would be probably the graduation ceremonies. Is there any downside? I, I know it sounds odd, but it's it's hard to think of one. 
the job is incredibly busy. And I think when you commit yourself to be a university uh, vice chancellor, you have to accept that you are on duty all the time. And some people might not like that and some people might not approve of it. But my view is that with leadership, certain responsibilities go. You take those on for a certain time and you make a commitment um, that you will be there if the institution needs you. And um, if you're not prepared to make that commitment at that level, then probably you shouldn't do the job. Uh, that's how I see it. So, uh, you know, the downside is that occasionally I feel that I'm being pulled in several directions at, at once. And the downside sometimes is that other parts of your life have to take second place. But that is the nature of leadership. And that's why certain people can do it and are suited to it and others aren't. And so I don't think that's a downside. I just think it's a side that's worth worth talking about because it's one of the things that makes the role challenging, I would say. I see. Well, I guess the one of the opportunities that uh, I think everyone in the university could see it was uh, in the university's COVID response. I suppose even us students were getting many emails from you. I think personally it went quite successfully. Going back to your, uh, your role is Oh, sorry. Let's go, go come to this later. Uh, first, I wanted to ask about the rankings of St. Andrews, because in the past few years, they they were good before and now they went very high. Do you see any reason for this? What, what would you say? I think there are reasons for it. I think that St. Andrews is a university that is really coming into its own because it is a community. It is a very collegial place. It's a university that that really prizes the individual, both in terms of staff and students, and tries to bring out the best in them. So those, you know, our, our Homeric motto, Ever to Excel, is actually a really good one because it's about not being personally satisfied with excellence, but always trying to take yourself further. But it's also about helping each other excel. And I, I hope we try to create a university culture in which people feel that that is what we are about. So I think that we, we're not perfect, no institution is, but I do think that we, uh, the premium that we set on the student experience and on individual success and that journey to success is appreciated. I also think that we have tried to generate a research culture that is inclusive and not over directional and that that also produces results. But I would also say that frankly, in relation to the league tables, not all of this is absolutely accidental in the sense that we do in my office scrutinize the methodologies of each of the league tables and we look hard at what strategic interventions might enable us to do better. We of course are not alone in doing that, other universities do it as well, but we would never make a strategic intervention that was at odds with what I just talked about which is what makes our university culture so distinctive. I see. So there's obviously the strength of St. Andrews that it is a community and uh, how we are striving to excel, but also some strategic planning. Yes, you know, we, we have to compete on the global stage and we have done things in recent years to enhance our global standing and, if you like, our global visibility. So we brought in, for instance, a, a global fellowship scheme, um, which was very much the brainchild of Brad Mackay, who's the Vice Principal for um, International Strategy and External Relations. And we think the effect of that intervention has, has been to heighten our, our visibility and our reputation. So occasionally you need to make these strategic interventions to, to enhance your standing. And we think we've done that quite effectively. Um, that is a very interesting insight into how to lead a university. Good. <laughs> and now coming to your alma mater, Oxford. So... Do you, do you feel any rivalry now that in those rankings we're often competing with Oxford and Cambridge? Um, inevitably, I think there is a bit of rivalry and um, enjoyment on the occasion when how could I not enjoy overtaking my alma mater? You, you know, um, I'm a competitive person. I was brought up to be a competitive person, so I've never thought there was anything wrong in, in being competitive, uh, providing, if you like, you know, you don't take it too seriously. Um, in the sense that I think it's great that St. Andrews and Oxford and Cambridge do as well as they do, because that is really great for UK education and it enhances our visibility and our desirability. 
I think it's really striking that St Andrews is up there with Oxford and Cambridge when it is not competing with them on a level playing field. Their endowments um, and their resources are hugely bigger than ours. So the fact that we give them such a good run for their money and our money is, I think, really impressive. So, yeah, there's a bit of rivalry, but it's it's friendly. I see, of course. And since I sort of asked everyone in the past few interviews about COVID, I couldn't help but ask you as well. Of course. Last March, when the council was going to lockdown, do you remember what you were thinking that it would mean for the university? And has it been confirmed? Yes, though I would say that, frankly, uh, we were thinking about that from at least January. Um, And I think that's probably one of the reasons why our response to um, the COVID crisis has been generally as effective as it has been, in that, you know, we saw this coming in January and we were planning for it as well as we could. And I think that, for me, one of the most important things in the university's response is that it's been a team response. My entire team in the principal's office has worked tirelessly in relation to trying to give some strategic guidance. And that has been reproduced across the university and our extraordinary professional services staff who work so hard and frequently came in every day throughout the, the pandemic. And the resilience and the inventiveness of our academics who've had to really regroup and offer education in digital form with no notice whatsoever when things first started. And I think our student community has shown incredible resilience and engagement and forbearance to it at an amazingly challenging time in, in their lives. Why is that? I think that we have tried right from the start. We, we recognize the scale of the crisis and we never attempted to deny or diminish that. To me, it was very clear from early on that this was going to be a massive crisis and a challenge in our lives. But we always took the view that we would be as honest and upfront with our community as we could be to keep people informed and to be as straightforward about what we thought we needed to do as we were able to be. And I I hope that's the the balance that we've tried to strike all the way through. So I do remember feeling that, that sense of dread that I think everybody felt back in March, sort of dread and disbelief, probably, at the emotional level. But we had been working on our plans in relation to this by, by that point sufficiently long for it to have, if you like, become a kind of normal. We knew something really serious was happening and we were as ready as we could be to adjust to it. And I would say the striking thing about this crisis is that when you're in a leadership position, you you have to deal with crises of one sort and another quite frequently, but generally they last about you know two days or two weeks. The thing about this pandemic crisis, which is one of the reasons it's been so demanding for all of us, is that it's still going on. And we've been in this very extended stage of of crisis management for, you know, nearly 18 months now. And that is different, but we should, you know, if you're my generation, your parents went through five or six years of the war and they never forgot that. It changed them. uh, It altered them. They lost part of their lives to it. But they did something with that. And I think we all have to try to do something with this experience and treat it as we absorb it as positively as we usefully can. That is an inspiring lesson about the pandemic. Is there something that we learn from it as a university? Yeah, I mean, I think in time we'll see a lot of things that we learned from it. One of the things we had to learn was actually how quickly we could all in, reinvent ourselves in this online digital form. And, you know, I mean, I was probably the, almost the last member of the principal's office to get onto Teams. Um, and that seemed like a sort of major revolution at the time. And now it's almost more normal than seeing people face to face, which is sort of a bizarre effect of, of the past year. I do think that the massive escalation of so many aspects of the digital experience and what that means in an educational context is has been one of the most dramatic and important changes uh, that the pandemic has brought. But I think in terms of what that means in the long term, how that settles, what choices we make, how people want in the future to experience education, I don't think that's clear yet at all clear yet and actually I find that rather fascinating although again from the leadership perspective 
it's quite challenging as well. Interesting. Uh -huh. So the time will show in a sense. Time will show, but we can shape, we can also shape that. So, you know, it's very important for us to get feedback from students on what you have valued um, in the past 18 months, you know, what, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So we need to know that. It's equally important for us to get it from staff because, you know, pedagogy is a two way thing. It's, it's about the, you know, the putting in and the, and, and the getting out as it were. And so we also have to understand what staff have found to be effective, what they found frustrating, what they felt has not really worked. So all of that we've got to kind of digest and take the best from. And, you know, we've started that work already, obviously, but it will take quite some time to process, if I can put it as functionally as that. Of course, yes. Let us now go to uh, next, the next round of questions, which are about sustainability. I uh, know that there were uh, previously some plans of a wind farm that St. Andrews was going to build, and then they couldn't proceed, and they were brought up again, I think, previous year. And I couldn't find anything if the wind farm is going ahead, or what stage is it in currently? Uh, alas, this is not straightforward, in that the decision on the wind farm does not sit solely with the university. One of the first things that I did when I became principal, actually, was to make a visit with the Quaestor and Factor to Kenley so that I could see the proposed site of the wind farm. And that was, frankly, that was a good five years ago now. So the university had long intended to develop a, a wind farm to help meet our energy demands. And, and that is very much still part of our commitment, which you all know about, to becoming net zero for emissions and indeed all forms of environmental degradation by 2035. So that is a stated, now stated aim of the university. And we remain, I would say, enthusiastic to progress the wind farm plans, but they are contingent on approval from the Ministry of Defence. And that is due to the close proximity of the air base in Lucas. So you know that the army are based in, in Lucas, but Lucas remains um, an active air base for the Royal Air Force. Um, so there are real, really significant concerns in relation to radar protections that the Ministry of Defence have a very strong view on here. So we've been advocating to try and get their approval for this for some time. And indeed, the matter was recently raised in the House of Commons by our local MP, Wendy Chamberlain. And since then, we've been seeking to progress discussions with the Ministry of Defence. And we're, I would say, sort of cautious about that. But I have to stress that we, we essentially remain dependent upon the Ministry of Defence in order for us to be able to make the proposals for the Ken Lee Wind Farm a reality. I see. So it is a complicated and slightly yeah. political issue. That's, you put it exactly right. It's a complicated and more than slightly political issue. And we're doing our best, uh, believe me, to move things along. And we're very grateful for Wendy Chamberlain's support. Um, but this is not a straightforward matter. I can imagine. Uh, another part of the carbon neutrality of St. Andrews, I think, is the biomass power plant on the Eden campus in Garbridge. And I learned that it's burning wood to produce electricity, which, uh, which is obviously what biomass or some biomass power plants do. But it raised the question for me if it is sustainable enough for us, if we shouldn't be striving for something more renewable or other renewable resources in the future. Yeah. So I think it's important to understand how the biomass plant works because we very much see the, the biomass plant at Eden campus as a, a core part of our sustainability programme. So the first thing to say is that new trees are planted to replace those that are burned. And thus, as the fuel can't be depleted, essentially, sustainable management of the facility makes it effectively carbon neutral. And some criticism has, of course, been levelled at other biomass plants, which use, for example, domestic waste as fuel. And that rightly gives cause for concern. But that is not the case at St Andrews. But the biomass plant is very much just part of our energy strategy. It's complemented by a series of, of further initiatives, such as a solar array, which is planned to be installed at the campus, and that will help us to transfer other parts of our energy consumption to renewable sources, and that those would include heating and also our, our vehicle fleet. And 
I would say that it's those efforts to go above and beyond um, which are really making us a, a, a leader in sustainability in the in the sector. Um, and it's worth just being aware that we are a finalist sustainability institution of the year in the National Higher Education Green Gown Awards. And that's partly, very much partly, because of what is regarded as our, our pioneering approach to energy production. So we would very much kind of defend the nature of the biomass plant and see it as superior to um, the way in which other types of biomass plant are, are set up. I see. Yeah, of course. It is, I must note, also uh, very encouraging that we not only have a target of managing uh, the carbon neutrality by 2035, but also are on the way, which is great, better than many other institutions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there's always more that we all need to, to do, but I, uh, and we know that our student community will hold us to account, Veronica, and I think it's absolutely right that you all should do. But we are very, very conscious that we need to show leadership in this area. And I think the work of the Environmental um, Sustainability Board, which has both staff and students on it, is absolutely fundamental to this. Well, thank you very much for this answer. And perhaps going to some lighter topics, I wanted to ask uh, what do you like to do in your free time, although you mentioned that your role is very busy. Yes, so my free time, I have to use it sparingly, but my greatest form of relaxation is reading. I love reading. I'm always reading. And I, I love to read right outside my comfort zone. Um, so I'm happiest really when I'm, I'm kind of, you know, plugged into Spotify and I'm, I'm reading a book at the same time. And I also love walking. I mean, if I'm not reading and I'm not working, I'm walking generally. And if I'm not walking to come on to probably the person you would ask me, I'm running. I am, you know, I, I believe very strongly that exercise is an important thing for people to do. It's certainly, it's probably one of the few things that keeps me sane. So you will often see me running in the university gym very early in, in, in the morning. And uh, uh, that's just something that's a really important part of, of my life. Oh, thank you very much for this answer. That gave me an incentive to start running well, as well. Whatever well, works, I just think, I think exercise, without being too messianic about it, um, I do believe in the whole mens sana and corpore sano idea. And uh, I think exercise is just, it makes me feel better. So I figure it probably works for other people too. I'm sure it does, uh, especially many people probably realised through the COVID pandemic, it's one of the things that yeah. keeps us sane. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, And you can do it anywhere. Uh -huh. um, anything else that you'd like to do to de-stress? So I really do think, uh, and frankly, you know, walking, running, listening to music and reading and other cultural pursuits, you know, my husband and I love opera and theatre and just, you know, can't wait for those things to start again in, in real life. Mm -hmm. I think uh, many people do that, it's right. And is there a hobby that you'd like to pick up, uh, but you haven't had the chance yet, perhaps? Oh, I suppose there are loads, but of course, I don't want to do a piece of advertising here, but I, I mentioned, you know, my commitment to language learning, and I do think Duolingo is great. Some people probably wouldn't regard um, learning languages as a hobby, but I love that app. I think it's a terrific way of giving yourself a kind of basic acquaintance with different languages. I, I still very much wish that I had time to learn Mandarin Chinese, and I know that, you know, um, you need a lifetime to do that, but that is a language I've not even really attempted, and I would love to have the time and opportunity to do that. That sounds incredible. Uh, it's an incredible idea as well. It's, it's an aspiration. But... <laughs> it's important to have. Yeah, it is. Let's go to the final round of questions, which is we call the quickfire questions. Okay. And they <laughs> they usually require uh, a shorter oh, answer, example, right? But don't worry, you, you like feel free to elaborate if you would like. Uh, uh, what is your favorite place in St Andrews? Bishop Kennedy's tomb. Uh, what is your favorite place in Scotland? Unequivocally, St Andrews. <laughs> of course. And which St Andrews tradition do you like the most? Um, I, I would have to come back to the way we do graduation. I I think that the way we do graduation is just absolutely brilliant and um the utilization of what isn't john knox's trousers that the uh, the arbuthnot berry um i do hope we can continue with that in the post-covid era because i think it's just a fabulous aspect of our traditions i think so do you have a favorite beach in st andrews oh it varies hugely but probably the west sands and do you have a favorite music genre and a favorite song it varies a lot 
but it's probably opera, and if I had to pick, it would be it would be Gluck's Orphée, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Que Caro Senza Udidice, that aria, I think, probably would be, you know, if I had to pick only one. Okay, and from all the books that you've read, what would be your favorite one? This is such a challenge, but actually I I do read some of every year. And I think as you get older, it, it becomes more important because primarily it's about memory. It is um, Proust à la recherche de ton perdu, which I read. Yeah, I read, I don't read the whole thing every year, but I read bits and pieces. And probably it's, it's both the early books and the very, very late books of Proust that I I reread and I find something new in every year. That is such an interesting book, such a nice inspiration. I was going to say something Scottish, but actually, if I was absolutely asked, I would say it's Bruce that I reread most often. Mm -hmm. And a slightly silly one, uh, do you have a favourite animal? I do now, because in the past year, Monique McKenzie, our provost, has been sending the um, the principal's office entertaining videos of the remarkable behaviour and habits of pangolins. Um, and I'm not sure I knew what a pangolin was until about 18 months ago, but thanks to Monique, um, I now have a kind of minor obsession with them, though, alas, I've never seen one in real life. So my favourite virtual animal is the pangolin. <laughs> that is such a great choice. Now, let's go to the finishing questions. So you're going to be the principal of until 2026 and perhaps beyond. So you're just finishing your first term, so to say. Do you have a goal for the university for the next few years? An idea of what you would like it to look like by 2026 or a direction that you'd like to go in? So we obviously have a university strategy up to 2023, and we're just refreshing it at the moment and with a view to establishing a strategy from 2022 to 2027. Um, and that strategy will very much focus on the themes of being world-leading, being diverse, being sustainable, being digital, and being entrepreneurial. That is my intention, that we should excel in all of those things and that we should feel and see their intersectionality. It's important to be world leading at the same time as being diverse. You know, it's important to be both sustainable and digital. And it's crucial, I think, for universities to be entrepreneurial. So those themes, I intend to define my principalship. And I hope by 2026, we will be even closer to fully embodying them. That is an incredible answer. Thank you very much, Professor Mapstone. It was an absolute honor to have you on our podcast. Well, thank you again for inviting me, Veronica. And um, I've really valued the opportunity to talk with you. So thank you again. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Physics Society's podcast. Thanks to our amazing interviewees for their interesting and useful insights. This podcast was produced by Marilyn Rosenquist and myself, Veronika Sedlákova. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, find us on Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn, or search St. Andrews Physics Society for our website. Goodbye!